Hi guys. Welcome. I was requested to do a video about the first couple of months of van life. I explained in my introduction video that I had always intended to start the YouTube channel on the same day that I started van life. That was always my intention. I'm still kind of bummed that didn't happen, but you know them first two, oh my gosh. It wouldn't have been any fun for anybody. But Teresa Romeo said that it would be good for me to go ahead and do a video about that. And I think she's right. You know, I think this um, channel is supposed to be sort of documenting that whole beginning process and I cut the first part out so I am going to take her up on her offer and um, do a little video about what them first couple of months were like teeny tiny bit of backstory I have struggled with mental illness since I was eight years old it got especially bad over the last mm, five to ten ish years it had gotten to the point where I was not able to keep a job I wasn't able to do really anything on a regular consistent basis that is how I ended up in a position where I wasn't going to be able to afford rent anymore. So you have to understand that when I started van life, it was not my decision. It was not something that I really was ever thinking I would do. And I was super bad off mentally, even before I found out that I was going to be living in a van. So when I did end up in that van, it was just, you know, blah. <laughs> I thought that I was going to be very, very prepared for this. The thing I did not understand was that all the videos that I was watching were mostly Bob Wells videos and other, you know, van lifers. And they were all showing life out on public land, out in the wilderness, out camping. So I was prepared for that. I, I think that I would have just snookered that baby. I don't know why I didn't think about the fact that I wasn't going to be out there in the wilderness with the bears where that was like all I had to worry about was whether or not the bear was going to find my peanut butter. I should have been watching city van life videos. I should have been a little bit more prepared for the idea that life was not going to be the same for me in a city as it is for van lifers who can be out in the wilderness. That's a completely different lifestyle and I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was not prepared. Here I am. Day one, in the van. Immediately I'm like, uh, like as soon as I get in the van for the first time, I'm like, well, where do I go? What do I do? <laughs> and honestly, that was kind of my brain frame for the next few days. Like I genuinely just didn't even know where do you go and spend your time? Where do you go to park? I'm not on BLM land, so I can't just like sit up a little campsite and look at the mountains like I did when I was in Quartzsite. Oh my goodness, I miss you Quartzsite. Anyway, another story. I just had like, um, I had an ice cooler and then I had just a mattress on the ground and me and my van and uh, I, what do you do with your time now? I got no power, I got no money. I'm almost positive that that first day, in fact, probably several, several, several of the first days, I would just go to a parking lot, sit in the front seat, and stare out the window for hours and hours. And I would just watch people pass, and I would just try and think about where do I go from here, first night. I didn't know where to park. I didn't know anything. <laughs> I was so green and I really thought I was so prepared. I thought I had gone to Bob Wells University and I had graduated with honors. But again, Bob Wells University is for people who can be out in the wild and I should have gone to City Living University. City Living Homelessness, that's the university I should have gone to. So of course the first night I just choose a Walmart because that's what everybody does. I do what everybody says, you gotta get there late, you know, so that you can be clandestine and then you wanna leave real early and stuff. I get there like 11 o'clock at night. I get settled in and then suddenly I'm hearing somebody karaokeing. Mother Tucker had set up a karaoke machine in the parking lot, 11 o'clock at night, and was singing and preaching and loud as can be and people are praising. Any other time it would have been, I would have loved it, I'd have gone, I'd have been jamming with them, but I just wanted to go to sleep. <laughs> I was tired, I had had a busy day looking at people in the parking lot all day. It was my first night in a parking lot, I was tired. And I just wanted the blissful release of sleep. 
and instead I got hello everybody I'm here to tell you about the Lord hallelujah pl praise you and it was just um loud and it was and I laid there unable to sleep for many many hours because he was there for a really long time. In fact, I finally fell asleep before he even left. I don't know what time he left. And you know, God bless his soul. I hope he's having a, a wonderful, amazing day. But it was just kind of a weird, <laughs> a weird introduction to my first night in a parking lot. And I just wanted to sleep, man. I just, God, please, can you let me sleep? <laughs> but God had other plans that day. It's all right, it's all right. Who might to tell God what to do? It ended up being, um, you know, a fine night. Other than that, I was only on one mattress at the time because uh, I, I thought that four inches would be <laughs> enough for me. No dirty jokes, y'all. Four inches was not enough for me. I was sinking to the ground. It was very uncomfortable. And then there was the whole trying to get up onto the toilet because the mattress is on the floor. You can't stand up. Trying to get up from the ground, up onto the toilet without any leg strength whatsoever. I was so, so out of shape. And I'm still out of shape, but I was so, so out of shape at that time. So like even just trying to pick myself up with my hands to get up on, <laughs> it was not fun. I did not master it. I was actually not a graduate. I had failed the course. <laughs> the second night I went to a different Walmart and on the second night I got the knock and it was terrifying. I didn't know what they wanted and I thought I'm on a Walmart. You're allowed to park in a Walmart, right? Why are they knocking on my door? And did I do something wrong? And are they gonna try and hurt me? And I didn't know what to do, but I, you know, I peeked out and it was a security guard saying, you can't sleep at this one, you gotta move along. So luckily it wasn't a dangerous situation, but it almost gave me a heart attack. And I moved along in the middle of the night, found another parking lot. That second night was a little better in terms of noise, except there was, I know now that it was like a street sweeper or whatever, cleaning the parking lot. I didn't know what it was at the time though. And I didn't want to peek out my windows to see what this sound was going past my car every five minutes. So I just, I just lived with it. I just lived with it. I just said, you know, listen, if the good Lord gonna take me tonight, the good Lord gonna take me tonight. I'm a freezer. I'm not a fighter or a flighter. I'm a freezer. When I see something that scares me, I just, and I hope nobody notices me. I'm a very quiet mouse. You don't see me. So I just froze in my van. Luckily, it was just a street sweeper. I think it was probably the third or the fourth day that I remembered parks exist. Hallelujah. So I started going to parks and I'm pretty sure that it was right around that time that I also received the solar stuff that I got. So I would put my solar panels out and I would spend the day at the park. And I would spend a lot of time standing up because I, I would actually just spend a lot of time standing in the door of my van, looking into my van, like, you know, with my hand up on the van like this, just trying to figure out what am I gonna do with this bitch? How am I gonna make this thing into a home? So lots and lots of standing, which tired my legs out because they were super not used to that business. So I believe it was probably the third or fourth night I went to go get into the van and my leg just would not, it just would not give me the strength that I needed to oomph myself up into there. And I fell and I crashed and I thought for sure I had broken my shin bone. I still cannot believe I did not break my shin bone, but it hurt like I did break my shin bone. So that adds like this whole new layer of pain to everything I have to do for the next few days. So I'm still sleeping on this stupid mattress on the ground. I'm still trying to get up onto the toilet in the middle of the night. Now I'm doing it with an almost broken shin. And I was not well because on top of all of this happening, I am super mourning my old life. I am in just devastating grief because I miss the convenience and comfort of my home. I miss my daughter. I miss so much my old life. So much more than I even thought I would. It was just this massive grieving process that I was not prepared for on top of all of the physicality of it, on top of just the, the, the newness of it, the scariness of it, the feeling like a failure at it already. I was grieving. I was grieving for my old life. And one of the things that I grieved the most was this mental 
freaking frack stuff in my brain. I had learned how to turn off a lot of the negativity by zoning out into the computer, watching videos, video games I would play, whatever I could, I spent a good amount of my time on my computer shutting this thing off. Cause if I don't shut her off, she likes to remind me of the fart I did in like fourth grade. She doesn't forget those things. No, no, no. She forgets what she had for breakfast that morning and it just plays on a loop in my head over and over. Remember that time? Remember that time? How about that time? Oh my God, you're so dumb. Oh my God, you're so stupid. Oh my God, you made such a fool of yourself. Oh my God, they all hated you. But I had learned how to turn that off by, I guess it's called dissociating. So I guess I was dissociating, but in my mind, I was just drowning it out with stuff on the computer and I couldn't do that anymore. And I still can't do that. And I still haven't quite figured out how to deal with that. Sorry, there will be some tears in this video because we're talking about them first couple months and they were hard. <laughs> That's still a struggle today, but I, I'm, I'm a lot more used to it now. So it's better than it was, but man, that first, that first little while of having to feel everything so freaking intensely and having zero way to buffer it uh, I, I didn't like it. I did not like it. I did not like it. And so there was a lot of mourning happening. Mourning for the life that I had and mourning for the life that I was hoping to have someday. Grieving it and finding a way to let it go. I've actually made a lot of progress on that one and going to Quartzsite really helped a lot with that because it helped me see what life will be like in the van when I can actually get out there and be a Bob Wells type of van lifer and I can go see beautiful places and I can meet fun people. Of course, because I'm gonna be moving around all the time, I'm not gonna be able to make any crow buddies. They won't know me. They won't recognize me as being an amazing human being that they love, but I can still see the wildlife all the time. I can hear the, tw tw the twittering all of the time. Best of all, y'all, like, hey, y'all. Right on y'all for helping to make all of this so much easier, by the way, I just need you to know that. Another thing about those first few months that was very difficult to get used to were the looks. When they see that you're living in your car, and it's like the judgment, it's, the judgment, it's like a hammer on your face. <laughs> And it bothered me so, so, so much because I, you know, I, nobody likes to be judged, obviously. And I think part of it too was that I had super a lot of internalized shame about it. So you're shaming me. That's real easy to do because I'm already shamed. So let me just add your shame to my bucket. Okay. Well, now I got a heavier bucket. Thanks. I do feel like I have a little bit of a shield now. I talked about that before. I have my RTR shield and my YouTube friend shields. And now when I get the looks, I, they don't bother me as much anymore. Like you don't, you don't know me. Thank goodness you don't understand it because that means you've never had to deal with it. And I hope that that stays the case for you. I hope that you never ever are in a position where you do not have a home to go to. I genuinely, genuinely, genuinely hope that for you. But man, you could be a little nicer about it. That's all I'm gonna say. I did try in those first two months to find, because the weather hadn't gotten super bad yet, and so I would try and go out and find like temporary camp camping spots, like BLM type land spots, but I wouldn't, I didn't wanna, you know, I didn't have a lot of money for gas, and I didn't wanna get too far away from my daughter, so I would try and just find spots that were like within an hour of the Sacramento area. That did not go well for me. I, w I was using an app called Gaia GPS, which I still I still stand by Gaia GPS, but I, don't, I guess it's just not infallible. <laughs> what do you mean it's not infallible? No, it's not infallible. And it would direct me to places that I, I guess are not actually places where you're allowed to park. I still don't know for sure if that's true or if that's just what the folks told me. I thought I had found a spot that I'd be able to get to pretty easily from Sacramento and go and set up for, you know, a few days to be out of parking lots, set up my camping gear and be a Bob Wells camper. I was parked there overnight and the next day I was like cooking something and this person drove by and at first I thought she was just being nice. She like stopped and she's like, you know, hey, what's your solar panel or whatever. And then I can't remember exactly what she said that made me realize, oh, she's not actually being nice. I think she asked me like how, why I was parked there or how, why did I think it was okay to park there or something like that. And I explained to her that, you know, Gaia GPS is that this is BLM land. And I looked it up on the BLM site and they said, it's fine. And she's like, no, 
Actually, Gaia is wrong, and I don't understand why people park here. There's just a neighborhood right down that way. They'll call the cops on you. She went from being like nice to real condescending real, real fast. It scared me off of that place. I couldn't go there. And then I found another place through Gaia GPS and like the National Forest website. Parked there, and I had a woman drive by and yell, that's not a camping spot. Which maybe it wasn't. I, I, I genuinely don't know. Guy GPS that it was, National Forest that it was, or that it was public land and that you could park there. But, you know, the people that live around these areas don't like it. They don't like us. And, and, I, and I do understand it. I get that a lot of people who live in their vehicles don't actually take very good care of the area that they are parking in. And so I fully understand why people wouldn't want us there. They don't know that I'm not somebody who's going to leave trash behind. They don't know that I am the leave no trace principle kind of follower girl. They just know that um, a lot of people come and they dump their trash and they take the space up for a long time and maybe I'm one of them. And you know, that, there's something to be said about assuming the worst of people. I've never fully understood that concept. Like, if there's a bad group within a group, why are you going to paint the entire group with the paintbrush that just comes from the bad group? I just feel like that's just a, a weird way to operate. So, once again, I did not feel comfortable there. I left. And I'd had a few mishaps while trying to find these camping spots. Very scary mishaps. Especially when everything you own is in your van. And if something happens to your van, what in the actual heck are you going to do now? So, there was a few times when I would be, like, following the guy at GPS or whatever and I would end up in, uh, down a road I shouldn't have probably been on and one of them times I went it was like in the forest so really like rocky bumpy roads and I'm trying to be you know a badass I'm trying to have courage I'm trying to face my fears I'm going down these roads it's a little scary but if I go slow it'll be fine I get to the end or I get to where I should be able to keep going and there's a gate there's a gate <laughs> with the big old no trespassing, do not come this way. Okay, I'm gonna just turn around, right? Okay, it's muddy. The road is incredibly narrow. I still don't know how to drive this big ass van because even though it's not Chevy Express sized, it's still much bigger than anything I've driven in many, many, many years. I could just try and back all the way down this probably like half a mile very narrow twisty road. I could try to do that and end up going over the cliff or I could try to turn around. Well obviously I tried to turn around and there was like this embankment that I got my, I backed into the embankment and the back bumper got like lodged onto the dirt mud root ball happening in this embankment. I couldn't move the car. I couldn't move the car. I had no bars on my cell, so there was, I could not call anybody. Not that I wanted to call anybody, because who wants to be like, oh my God, I am just such an idiot. I just came down this road and I tried to turn around and now somehow my bumper is literally lodged into the side of this mountain. Can you come get me? <laughs> and I wasn't even sure like how they would do it because like the, the space was so small but I couldn't call anybody anyway, it doesn't matter. And I didn't know what to do. And then I remembered some of that Bob Wells University did pay off. I remembered that if you, you can dig, try and dig your way out, or you can like put um, something down to give yourself some traction, because it was wet, right? It was wet mud. So as I'm trying to like get myself dislodged from this mountain, my wheels are just spinning. So I got, I had some wood, I used the wood to like dig and then I put like the wood stick down so that, and I was able to get just enough traction and tiny, tiny, tiny incremental movements to get off the mountain. My butt let go of the mountain. Thank you Tammy Lynn's butt for letting go of the mountain. I really appreciate it, but I sure did bend the freaking frack out. <laughs> My bumper in the process but you know like I said in my van tour video this is one of the reasons why I love the fact that the outside of the van is all messed up anyway because then I don't have to feel bad when I mess it up even further so she's got a little you know butt bump what you gonna do about it nothing that's what you're gonna do nothing it's fine let her be with her butt bump so up until that time I had had pretty good weather but then the cold came and I am NOT a cold fan 
Even under the best of circumstances, I am not a cold fan. Luckily at that point, I had already built the bed. And thank goodness I did that before the winter came, the serious winter came, because once the cold came, like it just slows your body down. Work on the van, shut down. Trying to accomplish anything, shut down. So now I am sad and still in pain from the almost shin breaking, scared of trying to find camping spot, and now I'm cold. And I can't afford a coat. Psst. I ain't got no money for a coat. I got a hoodie and a sweater. Which, since then, I've actually lost my sweater, ripped my sweater. And that was the best I could do. It, you know, it got me through the worst of the winter. So I am grateful for that. But it wasn't not a fun process. But eventually, the emotion of it all settled down. And it really is kind of crazy, the human being's capability of getting used to just about anything. Learning how to manage and live under just about any kind of circumstance. And I fully understand that my circumstance, while it was hard for me, was not nearly as hard as what a very good amount of people in this world go through. I fully understand how really, really lucky and privileged I am to have the vehicle, to have people that care about me. I did have enough money to eat all month. So I just, I want to say that I, I know that even, even in my darkest moments when I feel like the world is just nothing but one big razor blade, I know that I'm actually really, really, really lucky. And I knew that the whole time. Sometimes I would begrudgingly admit that to myself, but I did know that the whole time. And eventually it, it got easier. I built the bed, which made it much easier to get onto the toilet. I found a handful of parking lots that do not kick me out and I feel safe in. I just discovered parks where you can spend your days listening to the twittering of the birds and the kids laughing and kicking softballs and stuff. Wait, you don't probably kick a softball, do you? You know what I mean. Kicking soccer ball, kicking some kind of balls. So yeah, there it is the first two months. I hope that I was able to convey to you what that was like um, without actually having the video camera there recording it all. And I hope I get to see y'all again. Thank you very much for coming and I will see you shortly. Bye.